Hello, BookTube. I once again went to the bookstore. Not the Brattle Bookshop, not the basement of a friend's church with boxes and boxes of secondhand books. I went to Barnes & Noble. The great, big, beautiful, brightly lit Barnes & Noble in the Prudential Center here in Boston. It's the only big Barnes & Noble left that isn't attached to a university. Uh, it's the only Barnes & Noble in Boston. And I believe that it's the only big retail bookstore chain left. Certainly the, the, the only big retail bookstore in Boston. Uh, I remember a time when that was different, but that is no longer the case. Now, if you want to go and get the, the big box superstore experience that uh, Barnes & Noble and Crocs and & Brentano's and Borders made into made synonymous with retail book buying in so much of America, you're going to have to go to a Barnes & Noble. Uh, it always chaps my hide just a bit when book snobs will make a point of putting on their schmarmy Stepford wife voice. Make sure we go to your local independent bookstore, okay? Local independent bookstore. Meaning, if there's a, a 20,000 foot, square foot Barnes & Noble, drive by it. Because if you don't, you know, make sure you go to your local independent bookstore. Wouldn't want you and your whole family burned to death in the public square, now would we? Smiles, everyone. I hate that tone of voice. I hate that schmarmy condescension. A, a Barnes & Noble is a gigantic, well-stocked, well-lit bookstore. You're supposed to drive by it for moral purity testing. Uh, needless to say, I don't. I spent a long time working at a Barnes & Noble, and when that snobbery started to rear its head, and I started to encounter it, even sometimes people would dare to tell it to me to my face at gatherings and say, oh, you work at a Barnes & Noble, not a real bookstore. <laughs> Uh, I was never very kind when I encountered that kind of condescension in person, or even on comment boards. Uh, but nevertheless, despite the fact that I was a you know a, a staunch defender of the, a lot of what Barnes Noble does, they're as rapacious as any other big chain retail outfit. But for many, many, many people in the United States, for many, many years, the big, well lit, incredibly well stocked, and professionally run Barnes and Noble. But it's two stories, has a big parking lot, has a cafe, has a children's department, reading, book readings for children, book club events, all kinds of things like that. For many, many people, for many, many years, that Barnes & Noble was the only bookstore experience within hundreds of miles. I lost count of how many times I have heard people tell me that, both in person at my information desk and here on YouTube over the years. I've lost count of how many times I've, had, I've heard people say, well, yeah, I've, I've also heard about, you know, those local independent bookstores, people, snobs, but the only bookstore anywhere around me is my Barnes & Noble, and the crew is great, the, the selection is great, the stock is great, so I'm not listening to them, and you shouldn't listen to them. Snobbery of all kinds is bad, <laughs> very, very bad, especially when it comes to books. Oh my, the most personal thing you can buy. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that diatribe, I don't know where it came from, but... Uh, I had a, a, a real-world reason to go to the bookstore today. It was a sentimental reason, but it was still a reason. I had a reason to go. But well, once that reason was accomplished, I was still in the middle of a big bookstore. I wasn't about to go out empty-handed. So I, I got some stuff. <laughs> I got, they gave me a little, this little Barnes & Noble bag. I would have declined and just crammed everything in my shoulder bag, but my shoulder bag was already full. Uh, so I want to show you what I got at the bookstore. First, we'll, we'll, we'll look at uh, periodicals. I got uh, The Nation, uh, which is done on a pulpy kind of newsprint. Uh, I was hoping that it would have a subscription card inside, but it does not. I really like uh, The Nation. I like their, a lot of their the front columns. I like their longer think pieces. But, and I mainly buy it for the books, for the back of the book section. Uh, I don't know that I noticed... I just paged through this. I didn't actually read it, this one yet. But I, I, uh, I think I didn't notice. Yeah, there's. Uh, they review uh, Planet of Viruses by Carl Zimmer. Uh, and they review one other. Uh, Subtle Tools by Karen Greenberg and Reign of Terror by Spencer Ackerman. Two books on the legacy of 9 /11. Uh, big, generous reviews that'll be uh, that'll be a lot of fun to read. I got I got the Nation, and I also got uh, the New Republic. Could not turn down this cover. Tucker Carlson is melting. <laughs> uh, 
and once again, although I will read, you know, everything in the front of the book, uh, my eye immediately went to the back of the book, uh, the second half of the book, which is all about books. Uh, in this case, some of you will recognize that face, yes? Uh, Alexander Chi does a long review of Alec by William DeCanzio, that book about uh, the, the, the boy toy object of lust in E.M. Forster's novel Morris. Uh, so technically, that's what the, the review is about. But really, the, it's a long piece about Morris, the novel, and about Forster late in his, in his creative career, why he stopped writing fiction, what it was like to live. People don't realize A.M. Forster lived until 1970. That's, <laughs> I never, I always forget that. He seems so firmly entrenched in the 20s and 30s. Uh, that uh, I read that book. I wasn't overly impressed with the book, but uh, I, will, I will absolutely love reading Alexander Chi, a long piece on E.M. Forster. That's fantastic. Then the next piece is by someone named Daniel Besser, Bessner, and it is a review of uh, Humane by Samuel Moyne, which I read and thought was very impressive. We saw it on this channel. We got the advanced copy and the finished copy. And this is a nice, long review. It goes on for pages and pages, probably 6,000 words, 5,000 words, on Humane by Samuel Moyne, on that one book. Fantastic. Uh, then <laughs> there's Jennifer Wilson. A light goes on at likewise length about Beautiful World, Where Are You? by Sally Rooney. By Sally Rooney. I'm sorry, I said that title wrong. It's Beautiful World, Where Are You? It, it, there can't be any uh, intonation change because the question mark at Where Are You? is intentionally left off. Not because you're making any kind of deeper point, but because you're Gen Z and I don't know, it just feels like whatever. I, I'm just, I'm so tired. Do I really have to punctuate? Uh, <laughs> uh, but then uh, Kyle Chaika uh, reviews, the last review in this is Kyle Chaika reviewing Everything and Less by Mark McGurl, his book about the novel in the age of Amazon that we saw on this channel, I read and thought was spectacularly good, about the ways that Amazon changes the way we're thinking about books in all kinds of ways, not just how we buy them, but how we think about them. And maybe how they think about themselves. I, oh, I loved that book. Absolutely loved it. It's going to be great to read a long review. I'm sorry, I love this cover. It's going to be great to read a long review of that. Uh, and with all of those things, I have all of those books. But in all of those cases, I will pull out the review, trim off the ragged edge, fold it neatly, date it if it doesn't have the date on the bottom of the page, and tuck it into the book under consideration. Oh, but it, I didn't just get magazines at Barnes & Noble. I also got a book. I looked for some uh, bookmarks with tassels. I love bookmarks with tassels. I got one last time. Uh, but I couldn't find any today that really appealed. I will, I'm going back to this Barnes & Noble in, a, in just a bit of time. I will look again and see if maybe I missed one. But I was looking for a book. I went in for a sentimental, real-world reason that had nothing to do with books. But I was looking for a book. I was looking for the new paperback edition of Frank Herbert's Dune with the cast on the cover. The, the, the shop just got three copies of the movie adaptation cover of Dune, which in this case is not a grainy, out-of-focus still, uh, production still from the movie. Instead, it's the poster. It's the theatrical poster, which I thought, for a long time, I thought the poster was that image that we saw. You might have seen it yourself. Uh, of a dune from looking directly overhead with a crescent, half of which is black and half of which is the gold of the dune, and that's it. That is the picture. But apparently the movie studio is not going to go with that. Instead they're going to go with a Star Wars style poster that has the whole cast all looking in different directions with moons and planets in the background. Uh, and I don't doesn't really matter to me one way or another. It's an amazing event for somebody to do a multi two hundred million dollar adaptation of Dune. So I intend to own that paperback. But in the time between when the shop got those three copies and when I visited today, they those three copies had sold. Uh, so they're gonna they're gonna keep getting it, and sooner or later, happenstance will allow me to get it myself. And I am in the market for any other Dune merchandise. I don't imagine that the car that the the movie studio will authorize the recovering of all of Frank Herbert's original Dune novels, especially since they have relatively new art. I, I don't think they'll, and also it'd be false advertising to put the 
the movie cover of the first half of the novel, of the first novel, on the covers of all the others. It might be an inventive way that you could do it. Uh, if I were in charge of publicity for the movie, I would certainly do it. I would find an inventive way to do it. Pick really nice design stills, really nice uh, distinctive designs, designs that are distinctive to the Villeneuve movie, but that aren't that don't speak to the content of any individual book so that you are advertising for the movie with every book in the in the series and i've just put those new covers on all of them with the information on the back cover that it is now a new movie i don't think the kind of the movie studio is going to do that i think they'll only issue this this copy of dune and i want it of course i do uh but it wasn't there i'll keep trying uh and i'm up for anything else too a dune tasseled bookmark would be wonderful. <laughs> uh, maybe a blank writing journal, a notebook, folders, anything like that. I don't know if movie studios do that kind of thing anymore in the post-COVID age. They might think, you know, the profit margin is so unlikely anyway that we're not going to waste it. Uh, but I, I did get a book. I didn't get Dune. <laughs> but I got something almost as good. I got Emma by Jane Austen. In this edition, I confess these, these uh, Barnes & Noble Classics for individual books. I had seen them, of course, and you're all familiar with the, the big, ornate hardcovers that Barnes & Noble does that were $20 forever and ever when I worked at the store. I think they're now $25 or even $30 for those big leather-bound things with the built-in bookmarks and the gilt edge pages and whatnot that have like five novels by Jules Verne or the complete Ed stories of Edgar Allan Poe or a couple of Michael Crichton novels or things like that. I have a couple of those. Their Bible, their Holy Bible, is incredible. It's just a beautiful book. And the whole time I, that I've been going into the store, I've been seeing these individual volumes. But I, I confess, until today, I never actually picked one up and held it in my hand. They're lovely. They're just lovely. They also have the built-in bookmark. And they also have, it's not gilt pages, but the, page, the, the, end of, the edges of the pages are colored. In this case, pink. And the book is kind of a, you know, a brightish purple. But I, there's one thing I'm not going to be able to convey here, and that is the, the kind of, uh, there are the, uh, the lovely end papers there. They've got a kind of a rubbery finish to them. It's, it's not like any other kind of finish of the book that I've ever known. My only question now is how easily all of this stuff will rub off. And you might say, well, what a barbaric question. <laughs> well, how are you ever going to know how easy it rubs off? I'm pretty tough on my books. If this stuff can rub off, it's going to rub off pretty soon. <laughs> but if it doesn't, if it's laser printed on there, then I probably want all of Jane Austen in these formats. I had no idea that these books were so were so lovely. They are they are just so wonderful in the hand. And this one really emphasizes the heft of Emma, as opposed to Pride and Prejudice, for instance, or Mansfield Park. Uh, that's what it says. Jane Austen, Barnes & Noble, New York. No introduction, no notes, no nothing like that. Just... Just the book. Uh, oh, and there we go. The uh, the back end paper is Jane Austen's signature. How lovely. Just a wonderful, wonderful thing. I had no idea. I had no idea these individual classics. This was $15. And the complete Jane Austen is $25. So either the complete Jane Austen is very, is very much underpriced. Of course it's not. Or the individual books are very much overpriced, which would be Barnes & Noble to a T. Uh, I had no idea, though, that they were this... Uh, fun, this this kind of rubbery thing to them. So it, I might make it a ritual that when I go to Barnes & Noble, every time I go to this Barnes & Noble, I get another one of these. Maybe I will do that. I didn't. I confess, I, was, I fell in love with this Emma so instantly uh, that I didn't even bother to look really at what else they had. I'll have to I'll have to do that and see. Uh, but anyway, that was my trip to the bookstore. I got Emma. Can you imagine anything nearer perfect beauty? than Emma altogether. <laughs> How lovely. Just lovely. Uh, and I got two uh, magazines, both of which are political, but I didn't get them for political reasons. I may read the political stuff, uh, but I mainly got them for the back of the book. I mainly got them for the book's coverage. And in addition to that, I had a wonderful talk with, with a staff member there. It was the first time I've been to this Barnes & Noble in Boston in, uh, oh, forever. At least a dozen visits. It's been the first time at least a dozen visits where one of the staff members not only made eye contact with me, but was nice, actually engaged in conversation. That was, that was quite enjoyable. And the, uh, the very nice woman at the registers uh, gave me this little bag, <laughs> which I carried all my stuff around in. 
And the only difference here between me and my old friend Deb, she would also have got a couple of things and then and enjoyed carrying them home in her little bag. The only difference being she would put the bag on a shelf once she got back home and not look at it for 10 years. Literally not open it for 10 years. Oh, what's this? In 2025. What's this? Oh, I remember these. <laughs> Whereas I'm going to eagerly devour these things. The bag will be torn to shreds. <laughs> But anyway, that was my trip to the bookstore. Naturally, I felt like I was taking you along. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up. When Next time I go to the bookstore, I will, I will bring you along. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.